Shabbat Shalom and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you live from St. Francisville, Louisiana. Thank you so very much for joining us. I have a few announcements before I get into the class this morning. I'm going to be out next weekend and that doesn't mean that I leave you with nothing. We've arranged, Dr. James Tabor has agreed to cover in my absence, so he's going to be teaching. If you log in to see me on Saturday mornings, you do the same thing next Saturday, and Dr. James Tabor will be uh, on the screen and through your speakers next Saturday. But all of that is next week. Today, again, good morning, Shabbat Shalom, we are... Today, resuming our journey through the Pentateuch. As you know, we're following the annual cycle of Jewish readings. We are in the Bible's second book in the book of Exodus. And we're at Sinai. We're at Horeb, where we will be, at least according to the narrative, until we get to the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, chapter 10, verse 11, which tells us that at that time, which is defined by the text as the second year, the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifts and moves. And when it moves, it moves in the children of Israel, it says in Numbers 10, 11, they depart from the wilderness of Sinai. Now, remember, we talked last week a lot about this uh, parallel or horizontal reading. Now, that's the story according to Numbers chapter 10, verse 11, that at the second year, uh, the 20th day of the second month, the cloud lifts up and the children of Israel depart the wilderness of Sinai. According to Deuteronomy 1, 6, another way to put that story is that God tells Moses, you've been at this mountain long enough. Go, walk, leave. Very interesting. But in all... The children of Israel will spend approximately one year at Horeb, in the region of Horeb. And let me tell you, according to our narrative sources, quite a bit happens in that year at Horeb. And a major part of that, uh, we're going to begin to cover in this week's talk. Because a major part of what takes place at Horeb deals with what we call the tabernacle, the tabernacle. Now, I want to say this. There is more written in the five books about the tabernacle. This is the premier subject of everything. In other words, if you listed all the patriarchal narratives and you determined how much, how many words, what's the word count of the patriarchal narratives? What's this? What's that? And you put them all side by side, that which pertains to the tabernacle stands high and above everything else. It is the focus, Bamidbar. It's the focus in the wilderness. We're going to be talking today about the building of a mikdash, the building of a mishkan. I'm going to define those terms for those who might not know them. Like any worthwhile endeavor, at least in matters of faith, I guess I should qualify, any worthwhile endeavor begins with the right heart. And one of the things that we see in the narrative sections that we cover today, we are in, by the way, Torah reading, as the Jewish would call this reading, Teruma. Teruma is that which is lifted up. It's an offering. Um, it's the way it's translated in a lot of translations, an offering. Teruma. Teruma is that which is lifted up because room means high or elevated, exalted. So that's the idea. It's a story we're going to encounter right out of the gate this morning where God tells uh, he, he wants an offering to come forward, and he defines the parameters for that. Now, I want to look at this idea of the right heart because that is stressed throughout this reading. I want you to go with me. We're just going to go through a few verses to stress, to show you the stress 
that the writer puts on it. Go with me to Exodus chapter 25, <clears throat> Exodus 25 and verse 2. Actually, we'll start with one. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they take for me an offering, truma, of every man whose heart maketh him willing, ye shall take my offering. Every man whose heart maketh him willing. That's the ASV, a little bit, you know, direct and literal. But the idea is that, uh, and I want you to see this, that the people who are to, to give or the people who give are only those whose heart is willing. They don't preach that very often in, in uh, some circles, do they? Now look at chapter 35, Exodus 35. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. I want to show you in 35, verse 5. Listen to this. Take ye, plural, the, the old English, the authorized version uses ye for plural. So it's like you, you plural, take from among you an offering, truma, unto Jehovah. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. Jehovah's offering, gold and silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, etc. A willing heart. Now look down at verse 21 of chapter 35. And it says, uh, And they came, everyone whose heart, notice this, stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing, and brought Jehovah's offering for the work of the tent of meeting, and for all the service thereof, and for the holy garments. Now in this particular, uh, in this particular verse, Whereas the previous two, the heart is associated with the word uh, nun dalit uh, uh, bait, which is uh, nadav, which means willing. It's typically translated as willing. In this particular, uh, in this particular verse, the heart is nasa, wh whose ever heart is lifted up. It, it's translated in this translation, if your heart is stirred, but then notice it says, but your spirit is willing. Interesting. Nadav. Now look down at verse 35, chapter 35, verse 29. We have another verse that says, The children of Israel brought a free will offering unto Jehovah, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all the work which Jehovah had commanded to be made by Moses. So this is interesting. It's both men and women who were contributing towards the making of this thing we're going to talk about today. And But it's only those whose heart is willing. One more verse. Look down at chapter 36 and verse 2. <clears throat> and Moses called Betzalel and Aholiav and every wise-hearted man in whose heart Jehovah had put wisdom upon everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. Now, what's all this about the heart? There's something about this holy endeavor that we're going to talk about today. The only people that God wants to be involved in this, uh, I think I can say it this way, are those whose heart is willing those whose heart is stirred to be a part of this. And I would agree that that's the best way to do any holy endeavor is with those people whose heart is ready. Note, not everyone contributed towards the making of this holy thing we're going to talk about. The children of Israel... All of the children of Israel were commanded by God to take this offering. This is an interesting point. God tells the whole of the children of Israel, you, all of you, take a truma, an offering, but it, notice he says, but only take it from those who are willing. So it's like everybody has a part in the taking, but only those uh, which have a willing heart 
are the ones who give. All took, some gave, but only those whose heart was willing. Now, the question is, what are we building? What is it that we're making that everyone takes to bring forth this offering from those whose heart is willing? What are we making here? It is the most important thing, if you will, in the five books, arguably. And that's because there's more on this than anything else. Now, scholars, minimalist scholars, said, look, this is everything that you read about this holy place that's going to be made. Everything that you read is late. It's put in later. But uh, some of the scholars I've read, for instance, Richard Elliott Friedman, says they don't know what they're talking about. This language that's used to describe the making of this holy place is in classical biblical Hebrew, clearly early. So I want you to understand that there's something here that we really need to pay attention to. So go with me this morning back to Exodus chapter 25. This is where our reading begins, Truma, but we're going to pick it up in verse 8. This is God speaking according to the source. Exodus 25, verse 8, and it says, V'asu li mikdash. V'asu li mikdash. And they, or let them make for me, mikdash, what is holy. Let them make for me what is holy. So here's what we know, that that everything which we've talked about thus far, this taking from those whose heart is willing, is going to go into the making of something for Jehovah, something for Jehovah that is called mikdash. Now, in Hebrew, you might know the word kadosh. Kadosh means, typically, people translate it as holy, set apart. The mem on the front, the M sound, m. Mikdash, the mem means what is. So literally, you're going to make for me what is holy. All right? Now, I know a lot of people will take away the parochial element in holy. In other words, they, they say, well, it really, kadosh just means set apart. And you, know, you say holy, you mean something that the Bible doesn't mean. I want to tell you, I want you to keep an element of that definition that you already have. Holiness. Holiness is very high, very sought for. You know, God's people are told to be holy. And we like to say set apart, and then you, you diminish the uh, sanctity of the word. I would encourage you not to do that. I don't know that we've gone far enough with, de with defining what it means to be set apart. I think set apart means exactly what we have in our mind is holy. I think people often uh, take too much away from it. It means to be separate indeed, but it means a separateness that is associated with the divine, right? It's not just to be set apart. It's set apart with God in this context. Now, what will be the purpose of this holy or set apart place. Look at the, the last part of that verse. Vashakanti Batocham. And I will dwell in their midst. And you, plural, shall make for me what is holy, and I will dwell in their midst. Now, dwell is fine because it's translating shachan as uh, dwell, when most translations will say, uh, dwell, I will dwell among them. Dwell is fun, but technically, and I do mean technically, this I picked up from Friedman. He says that, and I've looked at other sources to validate this, he says that when Shechan is used with God, in context, dealing with God, dwelling, um, it's, it's really a denominative from the noun mishkan, 
And so it more accurately is translated, and I will tent or tabernacle among them. All right, now keep this in your mind because we're going to really explore this idea of this holy place that if made, God will tent among the people, and I shall tent among them. In fact, that's the way that Friedman translates it in his commentary on the Torah. Uh, and you shall make for me a mikdash, a holy place, and I will tent among them. Now, by the way, I want to point out that the same root word, to tent or to dwell, forms the familiar... Now, I'm going to say it two ways. I'm going to say it the way we say it in the South, and then I'm going to say it the proper way according to the Hebrew. Have you ever heard of the Shekinah? Shekinah? The Shekinah glory? All right, people say this all the time. We say it in the South with three syllables. We do this to a lot of two-syllable words. In Hebrew, it's really Shekinah. Shekinah. S-H-K-N-E-E -E is the first syllable. It's really not two syllables. I'm using this to illustrate the point. But it's hurry. Shkina. Shkina. And this you've heard of, the shkina, uh, but it doesn't occur in the Bible. The word shkina, or if you say it shekina, doesn't occur not the way people apply it, but the concept does, the idea does. This idea of God tenting or dwelling among the people, that does occur. God tells the Moses and the children of Israel that they are to make for him. He says, Vasu li, make for me a mikdash. And if they do it, he says, if you do this, and I will tent among them. The whole people, the whole people will take from those whose heart was willing. And I keep thinking about that idea, uh, that a preach. That idea of taking from those who are willing, I think is very important. Now, this idea of God tenting among Israel is a major part of, of Israelite religion, um, and it, it should be should be talked about quite a bit, I think, because not only is something in the historical text, but it's in the prophetic text as well. There's this idea that what God did in the people of Israel past, He'll do again. This idea that Jehovah is dwelling or tenting among the people is not just a thing of the history in the wilderness. Let's look at a couple of passages. Uh, first, let's, let's look at another passage in the Pentateuch. Go to Exodus 29 and verse 45. 29, 45. He says, and I, who's speaking? I, God. V'shachanti batok b'nei Yisrael. And I will tent in your midst or in the midst of the children of Israel. Now look with me at 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 6, and let's see, verse 13. 1 Kings 6, 13. And it says, V'shachanti batok b'nei Israel. Same exact quote from Exodus 29, 45. And I will tent in the midst of the children of Israel. Now this is in context, by the way, of the building of the temple. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to connect these two, and I'm going to show you some things that I bet some of you haven't noticed before. <clears throat> now there are other passages which deal with God tenting or dwelling in the midst of His people, I want to pick up one of those. Go with me to the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 10, uh, chapter 2, and verse 10. Now, it's a little bit different. If you're in a Hebrew Bible, it's going to be verse 14, I believe. Zechariah 2 and verse 10 in English, 
verse 14 in the Hebrew. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. That's our, that's our word, shechan, here. I will dwell in the midst of thee, uh, saith Jehovah, and many nations shall join themselves to Jehovah in that day, and shall be my people, the shechanti betochek, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, and you shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you. Now, Zechariah 2, as you know, is looking forward. I believe that this is yet to be fulfilled. The idea, though, is that it comes across in a prophetic sense as well. Now, we can get into all sorts of interesting things about this particular text. It's quite fascinating. Who is the speaker? Of whom does he say? Uh, who is coming? Who's going to dwell in the midst? It's a whole interesting thing. But one of the things I want you to notice is that in this particular text, many nations will join themselves to Jehovah. This ought to remind us of Isaiah chapter 2, Micah chapter 4, this idea of the Torah going forth, etc., and all these uh, prophetic glimpses. Now, look with me while we're in Zechariah. I have this in my notes. Let's see why. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse uh, 22. Oh, yeah. Yes, many people and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Jehovah. But notice the image, the image here is that God is dwelling or tenting in the midst of his people. Right? Now, there is, again, more about this holy place in the Pentateuch than any other subject. It goes into great detail, as you know. Talks about the construction of, not only the construction of, but the artisans. Who are those who bring this work about? I mean, like I brought up at the beginning of the class, it even tells how they funded it with those whose art were willing. It was taken up by all. It was brought together. Uh, and then certain artisans, they're filled with the Holy Spirit it says in the, uh, the books of the Pentateuch that they're filled with the spirit of wisdom and so forth to be able to make everything that is described as being needed to be made. The objects, the furniture, the materials. The, the Torah goes into great detail to give us the measurements of everything. The measurements of the box or the ark, the measurements of the table, the measurements of the curtains, how they are to overlap and they have rings on them and, and posts which hold the curtains. There are curtains within curtains within curtains and rooms within rooms and silver and bronze and shovels. And, and, and the question is, why? Friedman asked the question, why would anybody make all this up? What's the purpose of giving us this much detail, especially when the tabernacle is replaced by a temple? Ah, think about that. God says, make me a holy place. I want you to do it this way. I want it this size. This is the way I want it to look. I want everything about it. And then ultimately, everybody's focus shifts to the temple. As Jeremiah says, the temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord, temple of the Lord. The idea... People go to temple conferences. They love the temple. They even love the temple that Herod built. And Herod was a pig to be nice about it. But what did God tell him he wanted him to make? You know, a lot of people in the, I'm going to put air quotes here for those listening, people talk about, uh, this idea of, uh, let's see how to put this. I may leave this one on the table for a minute. Um, people, people look at these things and they miss something very, very important. I've decided to come back and pick this up in a minute. All of the details, everything which is described to be made is given with such great detail and it has to be made 
a certain way. It has to be precise. What we read about in today's lesson, and I'm going to highlight this part, is that everything that made up the tabernacle was done according to what in Hebrew is called a tavnit. A tavnit. Now, it's translated typically as a pattern or a plan. But tavnit is tied to the Hebrew word bana. It's like a blueprint, in other words. It's like a blueprint, like a builder would use. And the reason I connect it with a builder and a blueprint is because tavnit uh, is based on the root word bana, which means to build. So they have to make everything that they're supposed to make according to this thing that's built, this, the building plans. Might be a better way to put it, the building plans. The tavnit is something that is shown to Moses in the mountain. Now, what did it look like? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. It doesn't give us a lot of detail, but we have references where he says, do it like it was shown to you in the mountain. According to the tavnit that was shown to you in the mountain. Do this. Make this according to the tavnit that you saw in the mountain. Now, don't think that it has to be, you don't have to have in your mind, God opens up a blueprint, you know, and says, see, look at this. See, let me orient you, Moses. This is easterly. This is to the west. This is a room within the room. This is, could have been a hologram. He could have actually brought before the eyes of Moses a vision of everything that he wanted him to see in three dimensions. I posted this morning, you know, this uh, cartoon, and it, it's an iPad, it's two iPads. Moses is holding two pads, and he says, uh, you know, look, it's real neat. He has the Ten Commandments, one through five on one, six through ten on the other. He said, when you turn it sideways, look what happens. You know, and that's a joke. But let me ask you, could not the one who created a, a butterfly or created a hummingbird have made the Ten Commandments on something like this? Or could the blueprint not have come forth from something like, I mean, come on. So this idea of a blueprint, it could have been anything, at, but it's somehow the plan, the tavnit, that he shows to Moses is to be followed precisely. Everything has to be made according to it. Go with me to Exodus 25, Exodus 25 and verse 9. According to all, 25, 9, that I show you the pattern, it says the pattern, and it says in Hebrew, the Tavnit Hamishkan. Tavnit Hamishkan. The Tavnit Kol Klav. Everything that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the furniture thereof, even so shall you make it. Do everything, Moses, as the Tavnit that I've shown you in the mountain the top need of the Mishkan, the top need of all the stuff that goes in it. Everything has to be according to this. Look at chapter 25 and verse 40. Go down to 40. Uh, it says, uh, and see, uh, let's see, and see that you make them after their Tavnit, which has been shown to you in the mountain. You shall see and make it according to their tavnit. Now, look, look at a couple more verses with me. Let's look at Exodus 26 and verse 30. Exodus 26, verse 30. This is used throughout. I'm just going to hit a couple of the high points. And you shall rear up the mishkan uh, according to the fashion thereof which has been shown to you in the mountain. Now, here it's a different word. It's mishpat, which is typically translated as judgment. You know, according to the judgment that I've shown you, a mishpat, what is that? 
whereas you would expect it to say, according to the Tavnit that I showed you in the mountain, Bahar. But what I want to show you is that the Tavnit is essential, and people will often say, you know, in the Torah faith movement, we follow the Torah and the Torah is eternal. Not the tabernacle, not according to most. This is where I bring that in, which I paused on a moment ago. People are quick to say, these words are eternal, this, you know, but remember, this is from what they would consider to be something eternal. It, it is the making of a holy place according to a certain description, and the description is something which is portable, something which is movable, something which is, has, it has curtains, it has curtains on the curtains and, and covers over the curtains that are covering the curtains and poles and stanchions and silver and sockets and bronze and none of which describe the temple. Chapter 27 of Exodus. Verse 8, hollow with planks you shall make it, as it has been shown to you in the mount, so shall they make it. You reckon those hollow planks made it into the construction of the temple? And what a lot of people think is that the Mikdash, the Mishkan, pointed to this greater house, you know, that it was foreshadowing that which was intended all along. That's what they will think. That's what they might say. It's what they might believe. Really. The purpose of this mikdash, it's something holy. It's intended to be, by its building, to be a set-apart place to allow the holy God to dwell or tent among the people. For the holy God to come from his dwelling place to tent among humans, you better set apart a holy place. This is the image. And the plans for the making of the holy place the plans themselves are not the holy place. Let me see if I can make this clear. The Tavnit describes how you are to make something holy, a mikdash. But that which is made is taken from a plan which represents something else. You see, it's a replica at best of something which is trying to picture something else. Now the question is, is that the temple? At best, it's, a, it's an approximation of what the Tavnit intends to represent. Everything is supplied by those whose heart is willing. It's built according to the Tavnit by spirit-filled artisans. It's meant to represent something else. The question, though, is what is that? In the Pentateuch, what they make, remember they're commanded to make, according to the pattern, what turns out as a tent, a temporary, movable you can transport every piece of it. It's disassembled. I mean, look, a lot of the Pentateuch tells, you know, and this group is responsible for these items of the tabernacle, and these people are responsible for this. You know, and I always hear people, I want to stress this, I always hear people, the Torah is eternal, and I believe that the Torah is forever. And, you know, and you go, well, what about all that stuff about the tabernacle? Eh, right? Causes them to pause, does it not? What is that certain group of Levites that are responsible for packing the goat-haired uh, curtain? What do they do? Just give them another job? Interesting. 
What is made when, is, when it's asked of the children of Israel to make a holy place, a mikdash, a mishkan is what is the result, which is ultimately a tent, a nohel. It's a tent. A tent dwelling, a temporary dwelling, beautiful yet movable. And for much of biblical history, this was the holy place. Even more, it came to be known as the Ochel Moed, the tent of meeting or the appointment tent. Now that term was originally used for Moses' tent. Moses went into his tent and God would manifest himself in Moses' tent. You know you, the story. Uh, that was, it was called the tent of meeting. But then the Mishkan, the Mikdash, became known as the tent of meeting. Because God said, if you make this, that's where I'm going to meet with you. The, the phrase Ohel Moed, by the way, this is for your notes. I'm not going to get into this part so much now. It comes in a later class. Ohel Moed is used 140 times in Scripture. Guess how many of those are in Deuteronomy? One. Why is that? It's another class. Okay, look with me at Exodus 25. Exodus 25 and verse 22. Exodus 25, 22. And there I will meet with you and I will commune with you from above the, excuse the translation, mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. This place inside the tent, this is particularly talking about the area over uh, what we call the Ark of the Covenant, that is to be the place of meeting, but the tent is called the Ohel Moed, the place of appointment or the place of meeting. But I want to fast forward because I want to show you something. I want to fast forward to the time of David. Go with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, one of the questions that I want to entertain in this study today is, where is the tent? Where's the tent that was supposed to be built uh, as a holy place? What happened to it? Why, why, is, why was it done away with? It, it, should it have been done away with? These are questions that I have. I mean, you know, we read in the Pentateuch about quite a few things. We read about the Urim and the Tumim. What happened to that? <clears throat> okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass when the king, David, dwelt in his house, and Jehovah had given him rest from all his enemies round about, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell... In a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in thy heart, for Jehovah is with thee. It came to pass the same night that the word of Jehovah came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David. Thus says Jehovah, Shall you build me a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle in all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel. Spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd, uh, to be shepherd of my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore you shall say this to my servant David. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, I took you from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people, over Israel, and I have been with you whithersoever you went have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name like unto the name of the great ones that are in the earth, and I will appoint a place 
for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell, that they may dwell in their own place and be moved no more. Neither shall the children of, Israel, uh, children of wickedness afflict them any more as at the first. And as from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will cause you to rest from all your enemies. Moreover, Jehovah tells thee that Jehovah will make you a house. Remember this started with David's going to make Jehovah a house. Jehovah said, I ever asked for a house? I've never dwelt in a house. He said, I'm, Jehovah will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you that shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. Notice this. David wants a house for Jehovah. Jehovah says he's going to build a house. Yeah, for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the children of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Interesting, interesting, interesting. David, in his beautiful palace, says, looks out, he sees, what does he see? He says, God's in a tent. And here I am dwelling in this beautiful house. I'm going to make God a house. I mean, it's only right. I mean, think about that. God's in a tent. I'm in a house. And he tell, and Nathan says, that's good. Yeah, oh, I like that idea. Yep, go do whatever it is because Jehovah's with you. And, and then Nathan gets this word from God that says, never asked for this. We're going to talk about building a house. I'm going to be the house builder. Lest the Lord build the house, they that labor, labor in vain. Put that in your temple study packet. God never asked for a house. Verse 6, look at verse 6 again. Listen to this. Verse 6, for I have not dwelt. Now, in, in verse 6 in the Hebrew, it says, ki lo yashavti, babait. Because I have not dwelt, yashav. Now, this is the word dwell. Right? I have not dwelt, sat, or dwelt in a house from the time that I brought him up and so forth and so on. But he says, but I, ve'ehie mitalek ba'ohel. But I have walked about in a tent, uv, uh, uv mish, mishkan, and in a mishkan. I've walked about in a tent and a mishkan. Not dwelt in a house. <clears throat> now, God does say that Solomon is going to build a house, but notice it's not for God to live in. Again, look at verse 13. This is something you need to understand. He's going to build a house for my name. Okay? Now, I still have a major question. What happened to the tent? I mean, did you just, do we just throw it away? Okay, now Solomon understands this idea of a house for the name. He gets this. Look with me at 1 Kings uh, 8. 1 Kings 8. This is important. And let's begin in verse 17. Now, 1 Kings 8, 17. It was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of Jehovah, the God of Israel. But Jehovah said unto David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, notice everybody knows this for my name thing now, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son shall, that shall come forth out of your loins, 
Uh, he shall build the house for my name. And Jehovah has established his word that he spoke, for I am risen up in the room of David my father. I sit on the throne of Israel, as Jehovah promised, and have built the house for the name of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Let me tell you something else he understands. Look down at verse 27, 1 Kings 8, 27. This is Solomon. Solomon had it going on for a while there till he took all those wild women. You know, women will do that to you. Uh, 1 Kings 8, 27. But will God in very deed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I build it. So Solomon knows God's not, God can't dwell in a house. Yeshab, by the way, the word there is Yeshab. No one's talking about if can he tent temporarily, you know, some way, shape. The idea God says, I never Yeshav, I'm using the root word. I didn't dwell, you know, and Solomon says, God can't dwell, but in truth, he says, but in truth, does God Yeshav on earth, the heaven and heavens of the heavens, that's the way it says it in Hebrew, uh, the heavens or the skies and the skies of the skies can't contain you. Solomon builds a house for God's name, not a house for God to dwell in. Now, again, let's go back to my question. What about the detailed instructions shown to Moses on the mount in the Tavnit? What about all that? I mean, was it all just, is it done with? I mean, this is one of the major points of the Pentateuch. And if it's not important, you know, then I, my question is, why do, we, why do we have it? I mean, think about, this is part of the instructions from Horeb. Everything that comes from Horeb is supposed to be eternal, right? You got a warning to follow the Tavnit. Make sure, Moses, how many times does it say? Make sure you do it just according to the Tavnit. Well, some of those dimensions and all, that's part of the Tavnit. It's not part of the temple. The dimensions, the curtains, the skins. What here's what happened to that holy place, funded by those whose heart was moved, the Mishkan, which was described in minutia, about which more space is taken than anything else in the five books. Where does it go? Was it thrown away? I mean, after all, you know, how long can the thing last? It's old. We need to update it. You might be surprised at the dedication. Now, look, this is like watching a good movie with your friend. If you're somebody out there that thinks you know this, don't, don't try to, don't do a spoiler. Relax. Take your hands off the keyboard and relax. Let me unveil it the right way. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 4. 1 Kings 8 and verse 4. <clears throat> now this, by the way, remember 1 Kings 8 is the dedication of the temple. Verse 4, and they brought up the ark of Jehovah and the tent of meeting and all the holy vessels that were in the tent even these did the priest and the Levites bring up. Okay, you're at the dedication of the temple, the beautiful temple. And the priest bring up the tent of meeting. It's there. It's at the inauguration. Now, is it, is it important? Is this like... Uh, might be a bad example. Is it like an ex-wife at the new wedding? You know, something that's old, discarded? But it's there. By the way, 2 Chronicles 5.5 5 has the same exact story there. 
So the tent is there, but what did they do with it? I mean, who needs an old tent? This tent that's there at the inauguration, at the uh, dedication of the temple, is already 480 years old, right? I mean, hadn't the temple replaced the tent? Wasn't this maybe, perhaps, was this the plan all along? that the, the vision in the mount was to represent something which was going to be better, grander, more beautiful, more solid, more permanent. Is that what this is about? <clears throat> Remember what God said to David. Did I ever ask for a house? So I'm suspicious. I'm cautious when I say this, but I don't think the temple was ever anything that God had on the plan. I know a lot of people get nervous when I say that. You know, because a lot of people love that temple. In fact, in Jeremiah's day, remember Jeremiah 7, 1, he said, let, let me tell you something about this house. <laughs> Jeremiah 7, wow. You run around saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is these. He said, this thing will look like my house at Shiloh. What we need is a place, a holy place, where God can tent among the people. But if they're wicked, if they're not following God's ways, you can build it, you can make it, you can do it out of cloth or stone or diamonds, and it's not going to matter. Every piece of this represents building a place of holiness set apart for the temporary indwelling of a holy God. The building isn't the important thing, but that which is made, if it's made according to God's plan, is very important. So what, what happens to the tent? Do they have the ceremony and then chunk it away or, you know, put it in a storage shed in downtown Jerusalem? Well, there's an interesting Talmudic passage. It's in Sota, S-O-T-A-H, 9A. Listen to this. When the first temple was built, the tent of meeting was sequestered, including its boards, its clasp, its bars, its pillars, its sockets. In other words, the whole thing. The Gemara asks, where is it sequestered? And Rav Hista says that Avimi says beneath the tunnels of the sanctuary. Beneath the tunnels of the sanctuary. So here's a discussion. These rabbis are discussing this in the Talmud. They said, well, what happened? They're asking my question. What happened to the tent? You know why they're asking that? Because if you don't have the tent, you just took out a major section of, of the Pentateuch. I'm talking major. Now, you can always say, well, the temple sort of takes over. No, it doesn't. If this is true that the, that the, the uh, tent is somehow in the location of the temple. Ah, that's very interesting. It would mean that the Ohel, if this is true, what Avimi tells uh, Rav Hista, that the Ohel is either within the temple or underneath the latter house, but in the same space, the same holy space. Now, I'm okay with that. Let's, let's chase this down a little bit more. Josephus, all right? Josephus, uh, in the first century, is describing... Now, this is, by the way, he's talking here, what I'm about to read you, in... He's talking about the first temple, the first house. He's not talking about the second temple. Uh, he's talking about the first house. This is Book Antiquities, Book 8, Chapter 4, Section 1, if you use a Wiston, like a lot of people have Wiston, uh, I have this version, uh, this is a, 
Um, I think it's better. But if you have Wiston, it's going to be numbered 8103. So you still go to book eight and, and you go to chapter four and section one, but it's 103 there. Here's what I want to read. <clears throat> this is talking about the dedication of the temple. It says, so they carried the ark and the tabernacle which Moses had pitched and all the vessels that were for minist uh, ministration to the, uh, to the sacrifices of God and removed them to the temple. Everything, in other words, tabernacle, the ark, all that goes to the temple. You follow me? Now, um, it goes on to say, men's opinion was of his habitation with them in this newly built and consecrated place, for they did not grow weary either of singing hymns or of dancing until they came to the temple. And in this manner, they did carry the ark. Uh, but when they should transfer it to the most secret places, the rest of the multitude went away, and only those priests that carried it set it between the two caravim, which embracing it with their wings, for they were so framed by the artificer, they covered it as under a tent or a... It, it's the idea, it's in context, it seems to be talking about the tabernacle. It's being brought, it's all taken to the temple, but then it's like it's placed as it were in a tent. Interesting. Now, stick with me for a minute. The tent is removed to the temple, according to Josephus, and some even propose that this reading indicates that the tent was set up inside. Now, could that work? People debate on the measurements and so forth. Friedman has worked this out. Richard Elliott Friedman proposed this a long time ago. I saw it first in his material. But I want you to look at a couple of biblical passages with me. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 9. 1 Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 23. And so they and their children had the oversight of the gates of the house of Jehovah, even the house of the tent. Did you catch that? Why is the house of Jehovah called the house of the tent? The house of the tent? It's called Beit Ha'ohel? Is there a tent in the house? Could it be that this somehow was worked out in the plan? God said, look, I have a house. I have a tent. I want to build a house. Well, build a house. Just make it big enough to put my tent inside. My holy place that was made by the people whose heart was willing. Now, you might not follow where I'm going. You may not believe me. But the house of the Lord is called the house of the tent. Now look at 1 Chronicles 6 and 33. And their brethren, the Levites, were appointed for all the service of the tabernacle of the house of God. What is meant by Mishkan Beit HaElohim? What is the tabernacle or the tent of the God's house? Is there a tent somewhere? Well, it's called the house of the tent. Huh. Now, without a stretch... One might understand that the Mishkan was inside the temple or stored at the very least underneath in the underneath areas which gives it cause to be called the house of the tent. After God told David that his son would build a house for his name, David talks to Solomon. Now let me, let me look at, uh, go with me to uh, 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28. Now let me look at the verses here and make sure I'm right. Okay, 28.10, listen closely. Take heed now, says David to Solomon, and I to you. For Jehovah 
has chosen you to build a house for the Mikdash. A house for the Mikdash? I mean, it could have said a house as a Mikdash. You know, people call it the, uh, the house, the house, the house what? The house of the tent, the house of the Mikdash. Be strong and do it. Now, what follows after it talks about a house for the Mikdash, uh, you have to wonder, how is this to be built? Did David, how did David tell, you know, what did he pass to Solomon so that he could build a house for the tent, a house for the Mikdash? What did he give him? Well, let me tell you, you ready for this? He gave him a tavnit. Now, a lot of people just uh, see this as maybe David, you know, he's got, he's on his bed and he says, here you go, son. Uh, I, I hired the architects, you know, the, the guys from Tyre. They came in, I met with them, and, you know, now I'm old and I have these plans and I got them in this cardboard tube. Don't lose them. I've got a spare set at the county courthouse, whatever. No, what is, the, what is it that he gives him? It's a tavnit. But who made the tavnit? What's this tavnit about here? Remember, the tavnit in Exodus is shown by God to Moses in the mount. It's a holy thing. It could be like a hologram. Who knows? All right, now let's look. Let's read verse 11 and 12. Then David gave to Solomon his son... Um, let's see what he gave him. It says, uh, uh, Solomon, his son, the tavnit, the pattern of the porch of the temple and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and the upper rooms thereof and the inner chambers thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern, the tavnit, of all that he had, notice, by the Spirit for the courts of the house of Jehovah and for all the chambers round about, for the treasuries of the house of God, for the treasuries of the dedicated thing. It goes on and on. It describes all of this uh, important thing, everything that's to be put into the temple. It's according to a tavnit by the Spirit. Now, stay with me. Go down to verse 18. And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight in gold for the pattern of the chariot. That's the tavnit of the chariot even of the caravim that spread out their wings and covered the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah. Now, I want to read to you verse 19. It says, All this, said David, have I been made to understand in writing from the hand of Jehovah, even all the words of this tavnit. All of this, hakol biktav, miyad Yehovah alai. All of this in writing from Jehovah's hand. Now, how literally are we to take this? Eh. I don't know. We have another thing that we're talking about in Exodus. It was written with God's hand, with his finger, it says there. But this says, Miyad Yehovah. Sounds pretty literal. He gets it. It's something spiritual. He says, I understand all this because of what was given to me in God's hand. Could this be something that God wrote? Know some of you might think, oh, I don't know if I'm willing to go there. Well, I don't know. I mean, sounds pretty literal there. Here's what I will say. At a minimum, at least it's saying that this tavnit, like the one in Exodus, comes from God. Perhaps this tavnit had to come from God in order that whatever is built, David wants to build a house, God doesn't want a house, he wants a tent, 
So it has to somehow incorporate into the top neat. You want to build a house, make sure you have room for my tent. Which is what he wanted anyway. Remember, David, when he gives the plan to Solomon, it's really a plan for the house for the meek dash. The temple was not part of the original plan. God asked for a holy place to be made with donations from all who had a willing heart. The purpose was to make a set-apart place where God would meet with and command the people of Israel. It wasn't a place for him to dwell in. He's not Yashav. He says, I didn't dwell in a house. But he tabernacles among the people. He tents. It's temporary. The temple was not God's house. The heavens and the heavens of the heavens can't contain God. He can, however, and does, however, temporarily visit and tent among his people. The Tavnit given to David and passed to Solomon must have stressed the significance of that old tent. It was never removed far away. It was sequestered beneath the man-made house that was built for his name. But remember, this house for his name that he didn't ask for was ultimately known as the house of the tent, the house for the Mikdash. The Tavnit shown to Moses in the mount represents something, something, it merely points to something else. Tavnit is a plan for the making of a holy place. God does desire to dwell in the midst of a people, but the people in the midst of whom he dwells must be a holy people. And he's going to encounter them in a certain place in their midst, in a holy place within the holy people, where a holy God can temporarily meet. It's built by those who have a willing heart and a willing spirit, men and women, in the midst of the camp, a people charged to be holy was a holy place. And in the midst of the holy place was a holier place. And in the midst of the holiest place is an object that contains the holiest of all. And I'm out of time for the day. Next week, Dr. James Tabor will be here. I want you to be here as well. And I want you to learn about the heart of the matter. Whatever Dr. Tabor presents is going to be a fantastic class. Uh, I can bet on that. I know it. So I hope you're here next Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. Have a beautiful week.